the introduction yeah sure please sir thank you very much so with your permission i will announce this uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone for joining today's webinar i am dr amit borse and i am a senior product manager with iva a division of mk pharmaceuticals limited a pioneer in the field of gynecology and ivf we at mk are on a mission to nurture and support 28 days with programming 28 which is the foundation of vrt programming 28 is based on the concept of managing ovarian cycle with uh, gnrh analogs gonadotropins and hormones as per different protocol during this time of covid uh, we have tried to get uh, doctors together and continue with academics uh, we have today with us uh, uh, for this topic checklist in art uh, to improve outcome uh, dr jatin shah sir and dr kaperi manager ma'am this webinar is uh, done in association of isar and delhi state chapter of isar uh, although our uh, speakers do not require any introduction but i will take a minute or two uh, dr jatin shah sir uh, uh, is a director of mumbai fertility clinic and ivf center he is dedicated to the treatment of infertility couple and instrumental for establishing more than 15000 successful ivf pregnancies over the past 25 years he has been in more uh, than 500 national and international presentation guest lectures keynote addresses and oration we also have with us dr kaveri banerjee ma'am she is a medical director at advanced fertility and gynecology center new delhi uh, ma'am is a chair person for delhi state chapter isr she is a commonwealth fellow in reproductive medicine in london uk she has done more than 8000 ivf icsi donor and surrogacy cases thank you and uh, welcome to this webinar we are indeed privileged uh, to host this event and mcure will always be a preferred partner for uh, academic initiatives like this may i now request dr kaveri banerjee ma'am to take over the session and continue with it uh, thank you very much for the time uh, introduction and uh, i thank mq for giving us this opportunity and i thank dr jatin shah for agreeing to be with us uh, this uh, afternoon uh, today we are going to touch upon very important points of uh, ovum stimulation embryo transfer but before that it is the basics the female workup and the male workup which provides us with the diagnosis and uh, without which Uh, the treatment will not be appropriate so i shall go ahead with the, the uh, diagnostic part of the female and the male workup and dr jatin shah will then pick up the stimulation ovum pick up and embryo transfer and i shall then end up with a few more points on embryo transfer and we shall then be happy to take a few questions so uh right diagnosis right intervention and right time is critical in the successful management of any patient with infertility when we do the management we need to have certain checklists in place so that we are sure that we are not missing certain points when we start with the female checklist it is very important that we get the demography right uh it's very important to know where the couple stays uh, do they stay in town are they coming out of town how many visits can they make what is the religion of the couple are they happy to go for third party reproduction or not last but not the least is the age the age is so very critical in our diagnosis that a lot of it our stimulation protocol when we start the treatment depends on age so these are very important factors which we all should bear in mind also important is the type of work because infertility is associated with obesity toxins stress levels it's important to know whether the lady is having long sitting jobs is she in a busy schedule can she come regularly for treatment or do we have to modify the treatment according to her availability what are the exposure to toxins or radiation in her work field 
Personal history regarding smoking alcohol is very important, especially smoking in women with reduced ovarian reserve. And if found, though long-standing smoking does a lot of damage to the egg reserve, but if it is picked up, the advice can be given. Marital history is also very important. How long have the couple been married? Have they been cohabiting? If not, how long have they been together or they have been separated? So all these factors are important for you to decide whether the couple needs active intervention now or just needs some advice at the right time. Sexual history, often not given as much importance, but is very, very critical for your overall management. For example, a 35-year-old lady coming with her husband, married for five years, if we miss the diagnosis of non-consummation of marriage, then our overall treatment protocol will get out of line. So we must take the history of vaginismus, dyspareunia, erectile dysfunction in a couple. And we also need to know whether they know the frequency of intercourse at the fertile period or not. Have they been following it? Are they actually infertile or they've just not tried at the right time? Duration of infertility. So age, marital history, sexual history, and then how long have they been trying? Is it just less than one year? Is it six months? Or is it more than two to three years with active treatment? As long as your uh, treatment is on the higher side, that means, for example, a woman who's coming at 36, who's taken a lot of treatment for five years, I think our antennas will go high and we may go towards ART, especially IVF at a very early stage. But this will be in contrast to a 32-year-old who's just been trying for one year and perhaps not been together also. So all these are critically important questions that one must ask in assessing the couple. So we all know the importance of menstrual history and so much so in assessing infertility. Is it primary or secondary amenorrhea if she hasn't started with her period? Then when was her last menstrual period? Are they irregular cycles? Are they delayed cycles? Are they cycles with heavy flow or less flow? Is there dysmenorrhea? These four or five questions will give you a huge diagnostic spectrum of polycystic ovaries, fibroid, polyp, endometriosis. At least you must know where the diagnosis is leading to and a detailed menstrual history is very important. Obstetric history. Has she been pregnant before? And if so, has she miscarried? Was there a DNC? Was there a chromosomal anomaly? Was there preterm labor? Was there stitch put? And was there any obstetric complication? So all these things will, again, you will have to put your notes down as to our aim as fertility specialists is not only to give the positive pregnancy test. It is also to cross the three months and then give the delivery of the live baby. So all these points must be taken right in the beginning do we need to put a stitch? Do we need to add clexane? So these points must be clear right in the beginning while you are assessing your patient. Then we come to past medical history. I cannot emphasize more on how important medical history is. We must not miss out thy thyroid dysfunction, hypertension, diabetes, epilepsy, uh, patients being treated on antipsychotic drugs, whether there is any chronic renal dysfunction. So these points must be kept in mind. Proper control of thyroid hypertension. Is she on the safe anti-epileptic and or antipsychotic drugs? Has she been given clearance from her medical treatment or she is not fit to carry this pregnancy? and needs other options like surrogacy, adoption, or stopping treatment. 
So these are all very important questions that must be asked right in the beginning for an overall positive outcome. Again, in the medical history, previous history of tubal factors, cervicitis, anti-tubercular history, for example, if there is tuberculosis in the past, if there's any history of infection in the past, then our antenna must be high and we must think quickly in terms of ART procedures rather than waiting and watching just with medical treatment. A past surgical history. We know that even a small surgical history like an appendicectomy is associated with tubal factor. Even if she's a young patient, but she has tried for one and a half years, there is an appendicectomy done. The HST is ambiguous. Uh, in such cases, we must not wait too long in the hope that patient will conceive uh, naturally. Uh, more detailed investigations in terms of laparoscopy, tubal evaluation. If they are fine, we can wait and watch. If they are not fine, we need to offer ART. So these must be kept in our mind. We cannot miss these smaller points. Very, very important is what treatment has she had so far? So is it a 34-year-old, two years, no treatment? Or is it a 34-year-old, two years, with gonadotrophins, IUI, et cetera, et cetera. The entire spectrum of these two patients will be different as far as the urgency or need of treatment is concerned. For example, how many IUIs had she had? Has she had IVFs? And Dr. Jatin will, uh, sir will come more into details as to how important previous infertility history is, and especially if she's had an IVF, because that will help you decide your protocols, uh, your add-ons, everything. So you can imagine how important this initial one, one and a half hours is with your patient to chalk out an entire plan. So on basis of this previous infertility treatment, you decide on various factors. Then family history cannot be ignored. For example, if there is a woman with premature ovarian failure, we need to ask about her sisters. And if there is a genetic linkage for POF, the proper studies need to be done. History of carcinoma needs to be ruled out. And once you've taken a good wholesome history and you have certain pointers, then you need to focus on examination. And examination uh, for infertility specialists has become the transvaginal ultrasound. But there are these few basic things that need to be done, which will again taper your treatment and optimize it. For example, the body mass index is so, so very important. It uh, decides the success of treatment. It decides your lifestyle modification that your patients will uh, need. It decides your dose of treatment. So uh, BMI is very important, especially obese couples. The sexual history needs to be taken very carefully. And sometimes these couples have non-consummation, infrequent intercourse, and therefore the fertility is actually based on a different problem. So we should pay notice on all these pointers. The thyroid gland must be examined. If there is amenorrhea, scanty periods, irregular, make a look at the secondary sexual characteristics and be sure whether the hormonal levels in the body of your female patient is all right or not. Abdominal examination, we must not ever overlook. A large fibroid should not be missed. And uh, a scar, especially a vertical long scar, and you are planning laparoscopic tubal clipping, but you have not seen the vertical long scar and putting in the, lap, uh, the trochas may be difficult. So a uh, parabdominal examination is very important and all these must be mentioned in your records. A perspeculum, we have almost forgotten the art of perspeculum examination. And why is it important? It will help you rule out certain Mullerian anomalies. It will help you see the axis of the cervix. It will help you rule out infection. It will also help you rule out constant hydroya. 
So if there is hydrosalpins that is draining and coming out, you will immediately see water around the cervical os. These are large hydrosalpinges and therefore a per speculum, at least one per speculum examination is extremely important in fertility treatment. Our vaginal examination, again we see, oh, we are doing the transvaginal, what is the need? But a general idea of the pelvis, whether it is a frozen pelvis, whether the endometrioma is large, whether it is tender, whether it is fixed, whether it is antiverted, retroverted, large, a pervaginal examination also must be done in our assessment of the patient. A fixed pelvis uterus will guide us that maybe the embryo transfer can be difficult and we may need a mock transfer in this patient. Diagnostic evaluation. We all know these are important for our final diagnosis and for our diagnosis of the various types of uh, amenorrhea's, hypogonadotrophic, normogonadotrophic, and hypergonadotrophic uh, gonadism. So we need to do the episode, estradiol, and prolactin level. We also need to do the thyroid profile, check for thyroid antibodies, prolactin levels in case of hyperprolactinemia and galactoria. So TSH definitely should be in the range of 2.5. And if your TSH is constantly raised, thyroid antibodies can be done and levothyroxine must be given so that your TSH levels are in the normal range for persistently high subclinic, uh, subclinical hypothyroidism. The most critical of your test is a good transvaginal scan and it opens a Pandora's box for you and it helps in giving you the final crust of your plan of treatment. So you can look at your antral follicle count. If this is the endometrium on day one, day two, it's fine. It's a down-regulated endometrium. But if this is the endometrium in mid-cycle, it's not fine at all. So your planning will go according to that. Then there is the hydrosalpings, which you pick up and you need to do the appropriate management for the same. In many cases, your 2D is the initial guidance. And when you doubt the septum, when you doubt fibroids, you can get a good 3D scan that is going to rule out the nature of the septum, the uterine malformation, the fibroid mapping, and MRI can also help you in fibroid mapping. So 2D is for the scanning, the general outlook and 3D is for confirmation of certain findings. For example, then we come to the tubal assessment. This is in young patients who have not had much treatment. If the HSG is, uh, tubes are patent, we give them some time. But if the HSG shows such large pockets of fluid and hydrosalpinges, then we have to consider other forms, for example, laparoscopy and ART. So tubal assessment is also very, very important. Once there is an indication for laparoscopy, and there are many indications for laparoscopy, it could be tubal factor, it could be hydrosalpinges, it could be untreated polycystic ovaries, not resolving to your gonadotropins, not wanting IVF. It could be a first-timer endometriosis, so a diagnostic and therapeutic laparoscopy is very, very essential and it will give you a lot of diagnosis and treatments, for example, we'll come to that later. And then endometrial biopsy, a lot of uh, debate on whether TBPCR must be done, whether scratching helps or does not help, but many units have the protocol of uh, getting uh, endometrial biopsy by a people forceps and sending it for PCR. And if it is associated with any other factor, for example, hydrosalpin, thin endometrium, PCR positive, infertility, there is a rationale in starting antitubercular treatment. Many studies have ruled out the role of scratching in routine ART patients, but have not ruled out the role in a subset of patients with recurrent IVF failure and recurrent uh, miscarriages. So uh, some studies have shown that there is value to it. 
A laparoscopic ovarian drilling will help you in overall increasing your pregnancy rates by safe by providing safe ART, for example, or safe per ART. You can give high doses of gonadotrophins and you may reduce the risk of hyperstimulation in polycystic ovary disease. Of course, it has an overall function in medical treatment of polycystic ovaries. You can do laparoscopic ovarian drilling and wait for a few months for natural conception. Again, there's a lot of debate whether you should just do your IUIs and shift to IVF or you can give a stop gap and do ovarian drilling and give some more time. I give all my options to my patients and then we taper treatment according to their requirements, the time limits, etc., etc. You can't have a black and white treatment option for everybody. Endometrial cystectomy is uh, okay for the first timers, but this is not okay for women who are advanced stage, who have recurrent cysts, and you are continuously doing cystectomies and reducing the ovarian reserve further. So now I think we are quite clear where cystectomy helps and where it does not help. Laparoscopic myomectomy, definitely in those where it is intending the cavity, and where it is large intramural. The definition of large intramural varies. Sometimes it varies from about four centimeter to six centimeter. If I find a large intramural fibroid, say 4.5 centimeter, not intending the cavity, three eye wave failures, I will take it out. So again, there are certain gray zones in this. There is no gray zone in a submucous fibroid or intending the cavity, but there are gray zones in other fibroids. Tubal clipping, one of the ART techniques that has definitely helped in improving the IVF outcome by threefold. So if there is hydrosalpings and it is draining into the uterine cavity and you've not clipped your tubes, then your IVF success rate will reduce threefold times. So it's very important that all these steps are done and you've prepared your patient right in the beginning by a good history taking examination and radiological investigations. So these are, these we've all learned this in our medical school. There is no exact or science to it, but the finer points, for example, removing a polyp, uh, uh, salpingectomy, myomectomy, these pointers must be there. Uh, offering donor eggs to premature ovarian failure, not offering stimulation to a certain group of patients. All these must be done right in the beginning of your examination. So why do we need to do all these? We need to do where we see the age of the patient, the duration, providing sperm factor is normal. We can help in advising modification of lifestyle, changing or stopping certain medication that are harmful for the pregnancy, for example, certain antipsychotic drugs, providing vitamins and antioxidants at the right time, treating with antibiotics if necessary, medical treatment in a certain subset of patient, surgical treatment again in certain group of patient, choosing the correct ART. Is it going to be IUI, self eggs, donor eggs, surrogacy, that is decision is very important. What stimulation protocol? Uh, we'll come to that uh, by Dr. Jatin Shah in a few minutes from now. And add-ons. What do we give? Do we offer scratching, hysteroscopy, laser, ERA, PGS? It is beyond the scope of this treatment, uh, this webinar. However, in our history, if we have ticked the right boxes, at least we will know whether they should be offered or not offered to this set of patient. Now we have done with the woman. We are now coming to the male. The male is often ignored by a preliminary semen analysis. Count, motility, morphology, done, ICSI or IUI. But there's more to that and we'll come to that. Age, very important. Again, third party reproduction, whether you want to offer or not offer, you need to get your demographics right. A young patient who is having a lot of stress and is, say, exposed to, uh, uh, I asked a patient, where do you work? Just, you know, as they were leaving. And he said, I work in a chemical factory. So, he is getting exposed to toxins every day. No wonder his motility is so low. 
obviously I cannot tell him stop going to work, but at least we know there's a factor and if that can be modified, your occupational history is very important. Very important to get uh, comfortable with your patients and to go into the depth of the sexual history because they will come and say IVF, but maybe there is non-consummation, maybe there is erectile dysfunction, maybe a little bit of counseling, maybe artificial insemination, maybe psychotherapy is the answer and not IVF. So a little bit of probing is important. Personal history is important. Past medical history. Again, on certain drugs reduce the sperm count and motility and can also lead to erectile dysfunction. Uh, history of pain in the uh, scrotal area during intercourse uh, are to be taken to rule out urethritis, epididymitis, and to decide whether long-term antibiotics need to be given or not before starting any active treatment. History of trauma, orchidectomy, vasectomy, um, hydrocele repair, hernia repair. Again, sometimes these surgery, you know, you'll take, uh, there is low motility, low morphology, and you're wondering, patient is also asking, why is it, why is it? But the patient had a hernia repair when he was 19 years old. And in that case, sometimes the inguinal surgeries can also reduce a scrotal blood flow and could be one reason. So patients are satisfied to know probable causes and then go ahead with treatment. And it is our job to rule out these before we uh, you know advise them future treatment examination obese patients and i know lifestyle uh, factors are very very critical we focus so much on women lose weight polycystic ovaries what about the man an obese man with low motility and if he follows the lifestyle uh, factors his sperm count is definitely going to improve uh, there's a good chance so let us not overlook these factors because in overall it's going to improve your success rate let us not miss hypotestosterone uh, by you know less facial hair a belly and then obesity so gynecomastia so this should uh, raise the antenna for hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. Examination of the male genital uh, system. Now this is not routinely done in ART clinics. Sometimes it's done. In many cases, it's not done. However, if we, for example, if we feel the epididymis, that means there could be a block. If there is a varicose, Sometimes grade four varicocele, palpable varicocele with oligospermia, varicocelectomy is the treatment. Painful prostate glands, prostatitis, antibiotics is the treatment. Soft testes, hypogonadotrophic, hypergonadotrophic. So a whole lot of story evolves if you examine the male genital organs properly. So, for example, if you're not doing it at your center, some people send to andrologist, urologist, some people get an ultrasound done. But all these factors, right from size to seminal vesicles, you must have an idea if you're dealing with a man with abnormal semen count or infertility. And of course, you have the entire diagnostic evaluation and we have the WHO criteria, which we all know, 15 million, 40% uh, and uh, about 4% normal morphology by Kruger's criteria. So even in the semen analysis, we should not miss, we should not just stick to count motility morphology. What about low volume? What is low volume? Less than 1.5 ml. What can you pick up with low volume? You can pick up retrograde ejaculation with low volume. You can pick up CBAVG, cystic fibrosis with low volume. What about large volume? More than 1.5. Infection can lead to large volume. Again, the color, a reddish tinge is infection. So you can treat them. So it is important to go through each and every point in the semen analysis report. 
Aspinospermia. Again, the motility is low. So it could be primary ciliary dyskinesia, which is very, very rare. It could be long abstinence. So check your abstinence. It could be hyperviscosity. Necrospermia, sperms that are not moving. Necrospermia, sperms with low or zero motility. Infection, varicose, prolonged anuticulation. So these are the pointers that you must ask in your, once you have seen the semen analysis report to rule out certain uh, issues, sometimes giving a course of antioxidants, prolonged antibiotics and repeating the semen analysis will help you rule out certain problems. Keratospermia, for example, I remember a patient in my early days of practice the sperm motility was excellent and uh, we at that time more than 10 years ago we did not look very much in detail on the sperm head and so obviously we miss globozoospermia and missing globozoospermia has huge implications on treatment the sperms will look almost normal moving and you keep on doing your iuis but the patient will never get pregnant and even with ICSI globozoospermia, the success rates are quite low. Sometimes your embryologist may have to add calcium to activate the acrosomal end to improve your ICSI results. So it's important to look at the sperm morphology very, very clearly. Uh, leukocytospermia, uh, white blood cells. And again, we know round cells and white blood cells will look quite similar. But if there are more than 1 million white blood cells per ml, there is a good inclination of infection or inflammation. Antioxidants and antibiotics may be given and then a repeat analysis done. Let us not miss out measuring the fructose level in sperm uh, count. Uh, semen analysis where the patient is not getting pregnant and there is oligospermia, low volume. If there is absence of fructose, there is obstructed vas. So that is something we need to keep in mind. So suppose there is azospermia. You, it could be pretesticular, hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, hyperprolactinemia, androgen resistance. These are frequently correctable. Varicose. Testicular means testicular failure, undescended testes, mumps or chitis, genetic disorders, idiopathic, generally irreversible, except varicocele sometimes can lead to testicular azospermia, which is treatable. Post-testicular, your urologist, andrologist friends will be happy to treat in certain cases, though the results of vasovasostomy is not very, very high, but in certain cases where you have identified obstructive azospermia and you have had good uh, expertise, vasovasostomy can lead to the ejaculate coming up and then results with natural or IUI. Many of them will need IVF ICSI later on, but then, you know, if they are young patients and if you have a good andrologist or urologist, colleague, it is an option worth exploring. Low volume, and then when the patient passes urine after ejaculation, it is milkish. Post ejaculate, retrograde ejaculation, please do not miss it. And there is a way to prepare these retrograde samples. You ask the patient to take alcohol three times daily for two days, and then after the masturbation, they urinate and that sample has the sperm and that is spun. And then depending on the count motility, you can do IVF, IUI or ICSI. Usually IVF with ICSI is done with excellent results. Sperm function test, um, there are many tests, but for our practical purposes, usually the host test, and the sperm DNA fragmentation test. The host test for necrospermia and the DNA fragmentation test for uh, repeated IVF ICSI failure uh, to get a prognostications and treatment chart. So DNA fragmentation, though most of the guidelines are saying that it is not to be included in your, recent, in your routine workup, 
more than 30% is considered poor DNA fragmentation index. And in this, there are a lot of causes like environmental, advanced paternal, we need to rule that out. And so if there is a patient, I don't usually routinely do DNA fragmentation, but everything is fine. I'm doing ICSI, I'm getting embryos, patient is not getting pregnant. Let us do the sperm DNA. And in that we see that there is abnormal results. So let me look back. Have I ruled, have I ensured lifestyle changes are in place? Have I given the good antioxidants and vitamins? Is there a varicose that I'm not repairing? Is there an infection that I'm not treating? In the C, can, am I taking double ejaculate? We'll come to this. Should I take testicular sperm and do the XC? And should we have better sperm selection techniques? So this is the algorithm for DNA fragmentation. And this is slowly coming into your practice, though still not indicated as routine testing. Your endocrine evaluation, you need your FSH, LH, testosterone, prolactin levels to diagnose whether it is hypogonadotrophic, hypergonadotrophic, Hypogonadotrophic, FSH, and HCG yield good results. Hypergonadotrophic, raised FSH, the overall prognosis is poor, but still sperms can be retrieved. FSH is an indicator in some cases, but high FSH in azospermia does not rule out getting sperms in your uh, testicular biopsy. So you do the hormonal evaluation, and this has come uh, lately uh, quite, uh, uh, we are now using estradiol and testosterone levels in men with hypospermia or oligospermia. And if they are normal, it's fine. But if they are abnormal and your testosterone is less than 300 and your testosterone estrogen ratio is less than 10, aromatase inhibitor can be added. And then if they are, you measure them on a monthly level and you can add REC, HCG, and then doses are titrated. So if testosterone level, you can click a picture of this because it's quite a busy slide. Uh, basically what the message is that if testosterone levels are low, we do not add testosterone. Testosterone, prolonged testosterone will lead to feedback inhibition and further lowering the sperm count. We add aromatase inhibitor and REC HCG, recombinant HCG, and these will lead to your better sperm. And better sperm means better outcome. And your urology colleague and andrology colleague will rule out ejaculatory duct obstruction, CBAVD, and varicocele and spermatocele, which may need treatment. Genetic screening. Uh, when very low sperm count, non-obstructive azospermia, azospermia with absence of at least, so azospermia, recurrent miscarriage, very low sperm count, get a genetic test done. With genetic test, you can do karyotype, you can get further and do a microarray, or you can do exome sequences, depending on which problem. Now, I remember there was a patient with oligospermia. We used to do XC. And every time the woman would get pregnant, it was either miscarry, last time she had an ectopic, three attempts, then she was lost to follow up. And then she came back six months later and she said, you know, doctor, we missed doing something. What did we miss doing? We missed doing the karyotype. And there was balanced translocation. And then that time it was an affording couple. PGS was not so common in uh, India. They went to London, they did the PG, uh, PGS, they implanted one good blastocyst and they got pregnant. So for women, for men with oligospermia, recurrent miscarriages, please do not forget to do your genetic testing. Cystic fibrosis is not very common, but not completely uncommon. So when the VAS is not palpable, please do your CFTR gene mutation. Again, in hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism, uh, we must, Kleinfelters is one of the common, in miscarriages, the balance translocations and inversions. Azospermia, should we do testicular biopsy? 
what is the chance so you can do deletion in the region of the long arm and in that if there is micro deletion in a and b region very poor probabilities but in c region with severe oligospermia also and azospermia with testicular sperm it produces good uh, results now this is an important point we've done all the work up we are prepared for the icsi we have collected wonderful eggs and suddenly there's panic the man can't produce the sample who is responsible you are responsible why are you responsible because you have not taken that history it will not come out every time but it is mandatory to ask the man whether they are okay to give the sample at the clinic on the day of iui or ivf or icsi and many times they will say we are not comfortable so what can you do you can do a trial you can ask them to give a sample and see if they are okay you can get a home sample to reach within 45 minutes and to take a written consent that it is their sample you can freeze the sperm sample and in men with severe oats we have tried double sample on the same day and we have seen the second ejaculate producing better sperms so these are pointers that must be discussed before also in azospermia should we do a pesa uh, pizza should we do a tisa should we do a testicular aspiration should we do a micro tisa microtisa for difficult non obstructive azospermia is the treatment of choice but in testicular volume normal normal fsh uh sometimes when you see that the epididymis is palpable a simple pizza will give you good sperm sample so it's not black and white like it's coming microtisa for every azospermic patient you have to decide which surgical sperm retrieval technique you will use for your patient if the patient has come with previous ivf icsi failure what i especially is a spermic you will question was that an ejaculated sperm with severe oligoestrogen or azospermia was it a testicular sperm was it a fresh or a frozen sperm it is known that poor sperm quality sperm less number of sperm do not do well on frozen sample though the uh, data is conflicting on it some say it's the same but good sample fresh frozen is same result but poor sample fresh is better in some studies and also in our uh, experience then was the genetic testing done has have you done dna fragmentation test and repeated failure will you counsel double ejaculate and what mode of testicular sperm biopsy will you go ahead and why do you want to do all these history and pointers and checklist you want to again modify lifestyle change or stop certain medication prescribe antioxidants antibiotics hormonal treatment if necessary surgical treatment like varicocele suitable surgical sperm retrieval technique and then go ahead with your art to give the best outcome here the donor sperm donor egg discussion must be there donor sperm patients are willing they say you know we've had treatment or we don't want to go down the testicular route we cannot afford such high end treatment and multiple attempts have been failed so all these things should be mentioned and consent taken right in the beginning so we have this checklist at our center when the patient enters uh quickly we take all the points so uh, the previous one i'm just putting it in sorry so tubal test lmp menstrual history treatment so far any other relevant history and then your ultrasound your recommendations your investigations please do not forget your thalassemia your rubella the sperm checklist and this is a favorite checklist if you wish to take a picture you can this is because in a busy clinic 
you have various factors you know uh, whether you're going to use frozen sample whether the patient is going to give you fresh sample what was the stimulation protocol how many factors are you expecting what are the special treatments so it's better all this is given on the trigger day to the lab so that we don't miss any points which we have done in our workup uh, and before embryo transfer it is checked that everything has been done this is a lab record i'll leave it for the time being and dr jatin shastar will uh, discuss more about it so now i hand over to dr jatin to uh, discuss how we will uh, pick up the stimulation protocol and how we will go ahead with the egg pick up thank you very much thank you thank you ma'am for the fantastic presentation sir please please take over screen Uh, thank you so much thank you kaveri thank you mkr pharma uh, ladies and gentlemen it's indeed a pleasure to be here today for this webinar and that was truly a fantastic presentation almost mesmerized i thought i wish she never ended <laughs> because there were so many good points which i think all of you must have taken home so uh, let's now go through the main gist of the ivf procedure and that is how you will go about ovarian stimulation what all factors you should take into consideration to decide the doses the protocol whether to use fsh hmg which hmg which lh Uh, and so on then uh, briefly uh, what all you should be ready with when you are doing a good egg retrieval and then a few pointers and few tips for doing a good embryo transfer the last decade we have seen a huge paradigm shift in how we consider ovarian stimulation and this is because because initially uh, about 10 years ago our focus used to be totally on pregnancy rates in fresh embryo transfers so if you see look at this classical slide uh, this was in the era of fresh embryo transfer you can see the aim of our stimulation was to have 5 to 15 good quality oocytes and i'll come to that in a while as to why this figure came about we also of course didn't want the premature lh surge which is why agonists and antagonists were used the most important key point again for those who have heard me before and i keep repeating this is to have a uniform cohort of follicles you don't want one follicle to become dominant and shoot ahead of the others you want all of them to grow at the same rate especially in poor responders where as it is you are getting just about three or four oocytes and you don't want one to be a metaphase 2 and the other two or three to be immature you want to try and minimize the number of injections although that's not much of a problem thankfully in our country you don't want ohss at any cost you want a perfect endometrium you should have some surplus for freezing and you want it to be cost effective this 5 to 15 number came because of sankara's original study very clearly showed you can see here that the best pregnancy rates in a fresh embryo transfer cycle are between 5 to 15 oocytes and after that as you can see here although the predicted live birth rate which is the green bars was that should continue to be high you saw a sharp dip in actual pregnancy rates which you see in the purple bars because beyond 15 oocytes the estradiol levels are too high the endometrium becomes unreceptive it's advanced and despite a super triple line endometrium super top quality embryos you didn't end up with a pregnancy rate which is why everyone said that 15 was the magic number but then came vitrification and with that came the concept of cumulative live birth rates so although we know that for k for fresh the peak is at 13 to 15 oocytes after which there is a drop the emphasis now is not just on fresh embryo transfer rates but rather on cumulative live birth rates means how many pregnancies can you give a couple from one single ovarian stimulation so obviously the more the number of oocytes the more the embryos you have for freezing the more the number of embryo transfers she can undergo and the higher will be your cumulative pregnancy rate and which is what brings us to cos in 2020 where the aim is no longer just to have one euploid embryo or just to have one live birth but to do one ovarian stimulation and be done with it whether she wants one two or three offspring they will all come from the same initial batch of top quality embryos so how do you do this and the first and the most important thing which you need to be aware of is programming your cycle some of you may be doing batch ivf some of you may have a 365 day program 
either way you need a little bit of scheduling so that at least you can avoid the weekend and not put too much of stress on your embryology stuff the first and the most popular at our clinic is estradiol valerate 2 mg twice a day from day 25 she gets her menstruation you don't want to start stimulation for another one week so you continue the estradiol then you begin your fsh and the day before is the last administration of estradiol with this what happens the bleeding will stop because it's a low dose it's just 4 mg a day uh, menstruation will not uh, be withheld it will come at its normal time bleeding might stop because of the estradiol you will get a triple line endometrium but because of the negative feedback of estradiol you will not have a dominant follicle till you begin your fsh and this is the whole key point here that the, you have to ensure a uniform cohort so if you have used some kind of scheduling you know otherwise sometimes you call in a patient on say day 2 or day 3 sometimes day 3 may be too late because the dominant follicle has already been recruited in that case that one follicle will grow ahead and become 20 mm the others will be lagging behind at 14 or 15 mm and you will get a totally asynchronous cohort and a bad batch of eggs so this is the importance of giving some kind of pre medication to ensure that you get a uniform cohort of follicles there is a recent publication which says that why stop when you start fsh you can continue throughout the stimulation phase until the day of hcg and they in fact found a higher pregnancy rate of 27% as against 20% if you stop estradiol the day before starting fsh so you can see here if you give luteal estradiol cycle cancellations are almost half of what you would get if you did not use pre treatment also you get more oocytes and you get more good quality embryos with pre treatment another very simple way of doing it is to use norethisterone you just give 5 mg twice a day from day 20 minimum 7 days maximum 14 days stop any time between the 7th and the 14th day and 4 or 5 days after you stop you can begin your stimulation and again you have managed to program you have managed to postpone a menstruation by a week or 10 days you have not overly suppressed the fsh lh endogenous so you get a good ovarian response and you get your uniform cohort of follicles but my personal favorite since the last one year is to use an antagonist now in a clinic like ours which is a 365 day clinic we don't need to push cycles by 2 uh, weeks 3 weeks or a month all we need to play is okay next weekend there's a conference so i just need to postpone by 2 or 3 days what works beautifully and has a um, lot of benefits besides just scheduling is you give the antagonist on day 2 3 and 4 so she comes in on day 1 or day 2 <coughs> you uh, prescribe the antagonist on day 2 3 4 and then begin your stimulation from day 5 so this ensures that you get your uniform cohort the dominant follicle is suppressed till day 4 evening so it does not start growing till you don't begin your exogenous fsh and you have managed to postpone by 3 days the treatment also i'll show you shortly there are a lot of patients especially uh, pcos or some high responders where they have elevated progesterone on day 2 now this too is detrimental and therefore this antagonist for 3 days helps to reduce those progesterone levels and give you a much better outcome what i don't like to use is prolonged ocpil uh, pre treatment which i think most clinics continue to use till date and this the reason for this is that there are a lot of meta analyses and you can see this with anything more than 15 to 21 days of ocpil pre treatment ongoing pregnancy rates are lower the duration of stimulation is greatly prolonged gonadotropin consumption is increased and you do not get any more in fact you get fewer oocytes with prolonged ocpil administration so the latest consensus is that if you have to give ocpil it should be just for 10 days which doesn't overly suppress the endogenous fsh lh axis now a lot of you would be giving ocpils even to your egg donors and most of these are high responders and they will need an agonist trigger and not the hcg and then you find that you did not get as many good oocytes as you expected and this is because of prolonged ocpil pre treatment you will keep pulling your hair care how does this go wrong why did she not give me i thought i'll get 20 metaphase 2s and i got only 5 metaphase 2s the reason is because she's been on the ocpil especially egg donors are often on ocpils put on by their agencies and then whenever a clinic asks for a donor they stop the pill and they come to you you can see here the higher the suppression of lh that means the lower the lh at the start of stimulation which will be because of excessive ocpil administration the higher is the percentage of cycles with a sub optimal response so almost 40 to 50% of cycles will have a sub optimal response with lesser oocytes than what you expected with excessive prolonged duration of ocpil pre treatment so please 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 try to avoid using ocpils especially in high responders that is all your pcos 
all your high mh patients and all your egg donors because these are the ones who are likely to need the agonist trigger and if they don't have a good pool of endogenous fshlh left the agonist trigger doesn't work well and you end up with a poor crop of oocytes <clears throat> the next thing in the checklist is how do you decide whether you should use a agonist or an antagonist protocol now here for normal responders poor responders hypo responders anyone with an amh of say less than 3 with a normal bmi uh, maybe a 34 35 year old patient no associated pco the best protocol personal choice for me is the agonist but if you are a beginner it's better to go safe and start with the antagonist protocol so that you don't end up with a ovarian hyperstimulation in agonist you know you cannot give an agonist trigger you have to give the hcg trigger so if you end up with too many follicles you either have to cancel the cycle which creates a lot of mayhem with the patient or you have to face ovarian hyperstimulation agonist of course all of you are familiar so i don't have to go into too much of how it is to be done the luteal phase initiation of the uh, agonist which continues until menstruation then you reduce the dose of the agonist begin your fsh hmg both continue until the day of hcg and then 36 hours later you do your egg retrieval this all of you know but there are some key points here one is to watch for escape especially if you are doing a batch ivf one or two out of 10 patients who are on the agonist will escape its effect so when you call her in on day 10 day 12 when you expect no follicles no cysts no endometrium you see there is a dominant follicle you see there is again a triple line endometrium so she has escaped the effect of the agonist and she is not going to then respond well because her one follicle is already dominant she will not give you a synchronous cohort and she has to drop out from that batch so always watch for this escape watch for over suppression just as with the oc pill even with uh, agonist you will have over suppression of the endogenous fsh lh and since we now know that lh is also important in the follicular phase it would be wiser to begin these patients directly on hmg or a combination of rec fsh and rec lh rather than use rec fsh alone because if you use fsh alone you are likely to have a prolonged follicular phase and a hypo response so this is a very important point there Uh, you we prefer the daily subcutaneous rather than the depo remember that you can only give the hcg trigger in these patients so the biggest advantage for batch ivf of course is that you are manipulating the pick up dates as per the convenience of your visiting embryologist or a sonologist who does your egg retrieval the biggest drawback of course is increased risk of ovarian hyperstimulation which is why case selection is very important as i told you in the beginning high responders pcos total no no there is no way you are going to give them the agonist protocol and there comes in your treatment of second choice and that is the antagonist protocol 90% of the world's clinics it is still protocol of first choice purely because fewer injections lesser pain shorter duration of treatment flexibility of being able to give the agonist trigger in the unlikely event or a likely event of hyperstimulation or too many follicles and which is why it is so popular all over the world the reason i'll prefer the agonist is because we more or less have 90% of patients who have failed ivf somewhere in the world so there is no point really doing the same thing again and again and i find a lot of them do much better with the agonist with a combination of hmg with a little bit of hcg driven lh activity and so on a uh, frozen transfer instead of a fresh transfer and these are the minor points fine tunings in the checklist which have to be ready before you begin stimulation she has already done a cycle or two you have all the history with you as kaveri pointed out review that carefully make all the changes be ready with your program before you start the cycle again in the antagonist pre treatment is a must don't just call her in randomly on day 2 day 3 and start you are likely to end up with one follicle being dominant and a bad cohort of follicles so give her either estradiol or norethisterone or the antagonist for 3 days uh, then when you start stimulation don't have a fixed day to start antagonist some clinics have a fixed day 6 day 7 uh, you must start antagonist irrespective of follicular size this is not right you wait for the day when the leading follicle is 14 mm and then you begin the antagonist there is no need to increase your fsh dose when you start antagonist in the initial learning days we were told that when you start the antagonist you must increase the dose by 75 iu it's not really necessary if you feel that okay you want to add a little bit of lh instead of 225 fsh you can give 225 fsh and say 75 lh or 150 lh in the form of recombinant lh or you can switch totally to hmg and give her say 225 iu of hmg so that you add lh of course that would be too much of lh 225 so a combination in the ratio of 3 is to 1 or 2 is to 1 is always ideal the time of course interval should not exceed 30 hours between two antagonists and between antagonists and hcg again should not exceed 30 hours 
posting is not recommended. Remember, a lot of people do this. In a batch IVF, they give the PCOs antagonists and then they say, oh, the batch is not, the rest of the batch is still one day late. So let us post this patient by one day. Now, the minute you do that in an antagonist cycle, you're playing with fire and you're likely to disturb the entire cohort and not end up with good oocytes. So delaying HCG by one or two days in an antagonist cycle is not advisable. In an agonist cycle, it's called coasting. It has been done for years now and doesn't affect the results much in an agonist cycle. Here you can see a large uh, study from 2019, again comparing agonist antagonists in fresh IVF transfer. And you can see here number of oocytes, number of embryos, pregnancy rates, live birth rates, all were statistically significantly higher in the agonist group. And this is now why there is a internationally a rethink about is it really the end of the road for the agonist or is it the beginning of a new road for the agonist. So we need to now rethink old is gold and we need to come back and have fixed checklists as to which patient should do better with the agonist in the first place, rather than doing an antagonist, failing, and then going for a second cycle, which the patient may or may not give you the chance. Even in patients with diminished ovarian reserve, we thought the agonist will over suppress the patient who is already suppressed and not a good responder and will not give us a good yield of embryos. But you can see here again, this recent study, uh, group three Poseidon, which you know are young patients, who have a diminished ovarian reserve, so low AFC, low AMH. And you can see the agonist protocol had a live birth rate, which was twice the live birth rate, which was achieved with the antagonist cycles in these poor responders. So you have to take note of this, that the agonist is here to stay for a lot of patients where we had switched completely to the antagonist. This was a very important study, which we conducted at our clinic last year, just 36 patients, probably the best controlled study that you can have because the same patient underwent a first antagonist cycle and a second agonist cycle. Most of them were young, 32 to 36, most of them with a low ovarian reserve. So we are talking of Poseidon group three and a few group fours, those who were about 35. And these were potential poor responders. And you will see the first cycle antagonist from using a combination of REC FSH and HPHMG and agonist in the second cycle using only HPHMG 300 IU. Of course, many more oocytes were retrieved with the agonist cycle, contrary to former thinking that the agonist will give you less oocytes because of suppression, it doesn't. The trick, of course, is to use LH from the beginning, which is why we used HMG and not FSH. What is more important is the number of grade one embryos, top quality embryos, almost double with the agonist and HPHMG combination. So you can see here that the same patient, same patient is doing much better with an agonist and HMG cycle where she was considered a poor responder and didn't do too well with the antagonist cycle. And of course, poor quality embryos from 65% with the antagonist down to just 38% with the long agonist protocol. So we were more or less convinced. And now, of course, we've reversed the sequence uh, since then. And we use a first cycle agonist with HP, HMG rather than ending up with this poor performance and then switching to the next cycle. What about the FSH dose? That's the next point in the checklist. And it's very important that you select the correct initial dose. A lot of clinics, they start with say 150, thinking we don't want hyperstimulation. Then on day seven, day eight, they see, oh, there are not enough follicles. Let me double to 450, 300, 600, whatever it is. And then psychologically, they feel comfortable that yes, we are now going to get more eggs because we have stepped up the dose. Does this really work? First, let's see the normal responder. Now, if you see the normal responder, this huge meta-analysis clearly showed that you get much more oocytes with 200 as compared to 100. You get more oocytes with 200 or 225 as compared even to 150. So for normal responders, whether you're using the antagonist or the agonist, if she is an average IVF patient in the age group of 30 to 34, normal AMH, normal AFC, uh, first cycle, good prognosis, maybe male factor for ICSI, your starting dose should be 200 to 225 and not less than that. So don't start with 100 or 150 and then try to step up the doses on day seven. Also the cycle cancellation rate, you can clearly see was much lower with 200 when compared to 100 IU where you had a lot of cancellations because of a bad or a poor response. What about increasing doses? We know in Poseidon groups one and two, those are patients with a normal ovarian reserve who had an unexpected poor response or a suboptimal response in their first cycle, whether you did it or somebody else did it in the past. So they will come with reports that, oh, we were given a so-and-so dose and they got only, my AMH was three, but they got only four oocytes and we got only two embryos. 
so when this happens what you need to have ready in your checklist is to increase the dose of fsh when you do the second cycle you don't have to double it from 150 to 300 or 450 you just add 50 to 75 iu that's more or less sufficient and you can see here just an increase of 75 iu or so will give you a great increase in the number of two sites so this is of course only for groups one and two Again, the maximum dose should not exceed 300. Please remember, no patient anywhere, any BMI, any PCO, any poor responder, any low MH, any high MH needs more than 300. So 300 has to be your upper cap for all possible patients. So this was a recent publication by Dracopolo. Some of you might have heard his presentation also, where he said the same thing, that 300 should be your max dose. Some of you may argue, how does it matter whether you get three oocytes or four oocytes? Does it really make a difference in the pregnancy rates? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it does. You can see here, just getting two instead of one oocytes and your live birth rate increases from four to 8.5. So this is how important each oocyte is. And with each additional oocyte, you have an increase in the live birth. So one extra oocyte definitely makes a lot of difference. For groups three and four, what should be your dose? 150 should be the standard dose. There's no point giving more than that. Now, these are patients, young and old, who have a poor ovarian reserve. We're talking of Poseidon's three and four. They have low AMH, low AFC. She's uh, probably young or old, but she has a diminished ovarian reserve. However high you go with the dose, she doesn't have follicles and you cannot manufacture new follicles. So please keep your upper cap at 150 for this group. And you can see here this study from 2010, whether you give 300, you give 450 or you give 600 in this category, the live birth rates are the same. There is absolutely no difference by increasing the doses beyond 300 IU. So the outcome is going to remain the same. So to summarize the dose part, poor responders, Poseidon 1 and 2, you can give 225, max 300 for high BMI. Poseidon 3 and 4, 150 is the upper cap. For a very heavy BMI, maybe maximum you can go to 225. Normal responders, please begin with 225. Don't start with 150. Very important take home point here because stepping up on day seven is not going to help you. High responders, 150 is okay. High BMI, maybe 225. We are really not worried about this group because we have the agonist trigger. They will all be on the antagonist protocol. Most of them will have more than 15 follicles. They will need the agonist trigger, freeze all. So you don't have to worry whether you get 15 eggs or 25 eggs. It only gets better and better with more embryos. So very interesting. What about those adjustments on day seven? Like a lot of us used to do on day seven, you started with 150, not enough follicles, or oh, let's make it 300. Now, if you look at this, does it really work? Increasing doses on day seven. You can see here when you start increasing the doses on day seven of cycle, that is somewhere around here you start stepping up the dose because you don't see enough follicles and you feel good about it, please remember that this new increased dose will only achieve a proper stable level by day 10. That means new recruitment on day 10, even if it begins here, it's not going to begin on day 7 when you stepped up, but new recruitment which you wanted, more follicles will begin on day 10. But the follicles which have been recruited here are already almost mature by the time you reach day 10. So these new follicles are going to be very small and not going to reach maturity by the time you do egg retrieval. So please remember that increasing the dose on day seven is absolutely useless and is not going to give you a better response. Then what about the other way around? Suppose you started with 225, then you got scared of hyperstimulation. You saw 15 follicles. You don't have freeze all. You don't have a, a access to vitrification. What do you do? And you don't want to cancel. So you reduce the dose from 225, you go down to 100 thinking, yes, now I'm fine. Now she will not have hyperstimulation. Again, the same logic. It again takes three to four days for the FSH concentration to fall below the threshold and end new recruitment. So in the increasing dose, we saw that new recruitment would not begin for three more days. And here, new recruitment will not stop for three more days. So please remember, again, totally useless, reducing doses on day seven does not prevent OHSS. At the most, your estradiol levels will go down. You will feel good. But at the same time, you will not get a good cohort of follicles. And you will only reduce these estradiol levels and artificially feel that everything is better. But you are not going to improve her safety unless you do a freeze-all policy. What about monitoring? What do we need to remember about monitoring the cycle? I'm sure all of you do your own TVSs. 
then you do a lot of hormone estimations. You probably do E2 levels, FSH, LH, progesterones on day two, day seven, day eight, day 10, day 12, on day of ET, on day of pickup and so on. But what is the minimalistic and efficient monitoring that you should be doing? TVS usually required only thrice, day two, to ensure complete shedding of the endometrium and no ovarian cysts. Day seven, to decide whether you want to start the antagonist or you want to uh, change from FSH to HMG or add LH. And day, day 10 or day 11 to decide the trigger. Then estradiol, you just don't need to do it. In modern times, you don't need a single estradiol level unless there is an ovarian cyst on day two and you want to find out if it's a functional cyst. You do an E2, if it's more than 50, you know she needs a contraceptive pill or something to reduce that. But otherwise, you don't need estradiol levels. If you have hyperstimulation, you know you're going to give the agonist trigger. So whether your estradiol is 3,000, 5,000 or 30,000, it doesn't make any difference. You go ahead with your agonist trigger, you freeze all the embryos and get your fantastic pregnancy rates. Progesterone is the hormone of the day now. This is important. You have to do it two or probably preferably thrice if you are doing a lot of frozen embryo transfers. So day two, ideal because some patients, about 15%, one five, will have elevated progesterone more than 1.5 on day two, which is not good for the ultimate outcome of the oocyte quality. On the day of HCG, if you're contemplating fresh ET, so again, if the progesterone is between 0.5 and 1.5, you can go ahead with a fresh transfer if she has less than 13 oocytes. But anything beyond or less or more than this, you should do a frozen transfer. And in a frozen recipient cycle, you should do progesterone on the day of transfer. If it is less than nine, the pregnancy rates may not be ideal. So these are the three estimations of progesterone. And this is all that you need to do. You don't need any other intensive monitoring of any other hormones during an IVF cycle. So this is what I was coming to because a lot of people know about elevated progesterone on the day of HCG. We have volumes and volumes written on that. But very few people are aware of elevated progesterone on day two when you start. So we had these few publications and all you have to do if the progesterone is more than 1.5 on day two, you give three days of the antagonists, as I told you earlier, on day two, three, four, and then begin stimulation from day five. You can see here, after three days of antagonist, progesterone levels reduced from an average of 3.3 in the high group to 0 0.8, and their pregnancy rates come back on par with the normal progesterone group. So this is how you can easily rectify it. And if you don't want to do the progesterone day two, you could have a uniform policy of giving all patients three days of antagonists before you begin FSH stimulation. The other important point is high progesterone on the day of HCG. And we know the more the number of oocytes, the higher is the incidence of premature progesterone rise. So we know that when you have more than 15 oocytes, you're likely to have uh, maybe one in five or one in six patients will have a high progesterone. And that category, you would rather do a freeze all than do a fresh embryo transfer. Another favorite point in the checklist is what trigger to give the patient because that's very important to get a good number of oocytes. If you saw 10 follicles, you want all 10 oocytes and you just don't want 10 oocytes. You want all 10 to be mature metaphase 2 oocytes. So we know that HCG has been the gold standard but gives you a higher incidence of hyperstimulation if there are more than 15 follicles. And we have the agonist trigger where you have zero ovarian hyperstimulation but you have a grossly deficient luteal phase, which is why you can't do a fresh embryo transfer. You have to do a freeze all and a frozen embryo transfer. Should you use Reg F HCG or urinary HCG? Well, there is no difference between the two. If your batch of urinary is good, you can expect the same pregnancy rates. Agonist versus HCG, of course, we know the pregnancy rates with agonist are almost half than that of HCG because as I told you earlier, the corpora lutea are deficient. Your luteal phase is inadequate. Any amount of exogenous estrogen progesterone will not work in this category of patients. And finally, 250 or 500. Personally, I prefer 500 for most of the patients. Unless they have very low BMI, a very thin, lean patient, then maybe 250 is enough. And there are studies which have shown that especially in obese women, 250 is not enough and will not give you an adequate HCG level. HCG uh, agonist trigger, of course. Uh, 0.2 triptorelin is what we normally use. You can go up to 0.4, but there are numerous papers which say 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 all give you the same outcome. Of course, as I told you, you cannot use this in the long agonist cycle. So in an agonist cycle, you have only uh, two options. One is either you cancel the cycle if she hyperstimulates, which is a safer option, or if you 
love to play with danger, then you let hyperstimulation happen. And then you deal with the SITs and pleural effusion and emo concentration and all that, which in today's times should not happen because good IVF clinics are those which are OHSS free. Means you're not supposed to have any admissions for hyperstimulation. Some of you who don't have a good vitrification program would say, okay, I'll give the agonist trigger and I'll add back HCG to rescue the luteal phase. Yes, there are studies where this was done and you get back an excellent pregnancy rate, clinical pregnancy rate back up to 50% with add back HCG. But you again have an unacceptably high incidence, 14% of ovarian hyperstimulation. A lot of these are the pregnancy onset hyperstimulations which go on for 20 to 30 days with repeated ascitic tappings, not an ideal scenario, best avoided and therefore better to just freeze all and not uh, do all these heroics. For normal responders and hyporesponders, what we prefer because in a lot of patients, you will get a good number of oocytes. Uh, but suppose you had 15 follicles and you got only 7 oocytes. That means your trigger was not adequate. Dual trigger, that means a combination of HCG 6500 with double, uh, the agonist, about 0.2 milligram triptorelin. And you can see with the double trigger, number of oocytes from 2 goes up to 7. Top quality embryos from 0.4 to 3.7. These are all statistically significant better performances with the double trigger as compared to HCG alone. Many a times you get adequate number of oocytes, but you don't get adequate metaphase 2s. So you had 10 oocytes, but only 3 metaphase 2s. Again, even in the next cycle, you give her a double trigger, you will get back good number of metaphase 2s, doubling from 3 to 6.5. Uh, many more top quality embryos from 1 to 3. Again, statistically significantly better performance with the use of the double trigger. And this was, of course, a recent publication that even in poor responders, patients with a diminished reserve, the dual trigger gives you much better performance in terms of fertilization rates, live birth rates, lower miscarriage rates, and so on. So the dual trigger is our first choice for a lot of these patients. The next important question which I often get is whether to use REC FSH or HMG, which is better. Now we have enough Cochrane analysis which show us the meta-analysis that both are equally effective. But there is a one new advance recently and uh, that needs to be highlighted and that is the Megaset trial, which some of you might have read. It was just published about three weeks ago in Fertility Sterility. And why is it important? This paper tells us okay, what does it change your incidence of hyperstimulation, which apparently is higher with REC FSH. Does it increase or reduce the incidence of premature progesterone rise? Again, that is more with REC FSH as compared to HMG and whether your embryo transfer and success rates are better with HMG or with REC FSH. This is really uh, absolutely amazing advance because till now we have been taught that in high responders, in PCOs, don't give LH. You have to use only pure FSH. And this has been just put into us that PCOs means no LH is to be given because they already have high LH. Now the best part of this paper is that this makes us think again whether this is actually true. So you can see what is the trial about. They compared REC FSH in half the patients versus HPHMG. And of course, it was a standard 150 IU dose with the antagonist, with the HCG trigger, and then fresh embryo transfer, and then with a the luteal phase support. So that's pretty much standard. And what was fascinating was that when you look at fresh cycle pregnancy rates, you can see the HMG group did much better. The blue is the HMG, the gray is the REC FSH group, and you can see pregnancy rates in fresh cycles, ongoing pregnancy rates, live birth rates, all better with the HP HMG. Early pregnancy loss, again, lower with HP HMG as compared to REC FSH. What about frozen transfer cycles? Again, for some reason, that means it does affect the embryo quality also, not just the endometrial receptivity. And you can see here, Again, live birth rates, live birth rate, live birth rate higher with HPHMG as compared to REC FSH. Pregnancy loss is much lower with HPHMG. And finally, of course, the third arm was hyperstimulation. This was remarkable because you had a significantly lower incidence of OHSS with HPHMG versus RFSH. So this is a whole circle that we've turned around. You know, 30 years ago when I started, we had only one drug available, Pergonal, which was an equal combination of FSH and LH, our urinary drugs. Uh, we used that and we had very good results. Then came Metrodin, pure FSH, and then all this talk about F PCOs not requiring LH and so on. Then we had highly purified FSH, REC FSH, and now again we turn a whole circle. 
we have upcoming some products with a combination of 2s21 3s21 fsh lh which might work wonders too or we have hp hmg with hcg21 lh activity which also as this paper shows might give you better results than using fsh alone so it's a really revolutionary finding here which needs to be taken note of and of course it's up to all of you to have your own experience high responders of course things have become very simple now we know that previously we used to really struggle with this category because a lot of them used to have hyperstimulation especially after 15 two sites there was a much higher incidence of ohss but now with the three musketeer approach you have practically eliminated any kind of problem with pcos all you need to do use an antagonist protocol whenever you suspect a high responder high mh pco all the patients use only the agonist trigger the second musketeer and three do just freeze all and don't try to do fresh transfers for these patients so if you take the three musketeer approach and you can see this is when we started doing this in 2015 127 patients agonist trigger for all antagonist protocol fixed dose of rec fsh freezing on day 2 thought transfer in a agonist and estrogen prime cycle and straight away you get almost a 50% clinical pregnancy rate ongoing pregnancy rate in the first frozen embryo transfer so this works like magic for the pcos you don't need to have any ohss and you get excellent pregnancy rates with vitrification poor responders of course there are three simple categories you have to remember in your checklist when you begin that which category does this patient fall into of course you know the poseidon's grave 1 2 3 4 so there is one category who doesn't have enough fsh sensitive follicles so she is the one with a diminished ovarian reserve there is a second patient who had adequate follicles but you gave her inadequate dose for her bmi so she needs a increase in the dose in the next cycle and the third one she has adequate follicles you gave her adequate dose but she was a hypo responder and didn't give you the best follicles because she is a carrier of fsh and lh receptor polymorphisms because of which she did not respond ideally so of course most of you have heard these talks of mine on group 1 2 3 4 for 1 and 2 as i told you pre treatment is very important because the commonest reason for a unexpected or unexplained suboptimal response is usually a asynchronous cohort so please focus on pre treatment please try to use more of the agonist and the hmg increasing the dose as i told you just 75 more in the next cycle and maybe you could use some lh or hmg instead of your fsh and usually most of these patients do much better in the second cycle 3 and 4 of course are the difficult cases where again i personally prefer the agonist i prefer to use hmg 300 maybe 150 as i told you earlier is enough uh, maximum 225 not 300 sorry and some of them might need embryo accumulation with a frozen embryo transfer some of them might need pgta especially if they have a history of miscarriages but what i want to show all of you is the dual stimulation and that is a really fascinating advance which we now have we know a lot of women have multiple waves of follicular recruitment so till now we thought that there is only one phase of follicular recruitment in the follicular phase uh, and that's it nothing happens in the luteal phase but now we know that even in the luteal phase there are waves of follicular recruitment so the whole idea of doing a dual stimulation is to exploit this very easy to do rec fsh and rec lh from day 2 add the antagonist day 7 agonist trigger don't give hcg do your egg retrieval at 36 hours stop stimulation for 3 to 4 days again start rec fsh rec lh again the antagonist again the agonist trigger and again a pick up sometimes this retrieval because i've done a lot of cases now is during menstruation don't bother about it you'll get a good crop of eggs and a good number of embryos so the logic here is the follicular phase these are the follicular phase embryos which are euploidic and these are the luteal phase embryos which are euploidic and you can see here the rate of patients obtaining at least one euploid normal blastocyst increased from 42% with follicular phase stimulation to 65.5% with the contribution of luteal phase stimulation for some unknown reason the luteal phase somehow gives you better top quality embryos than the follicular phase and i have seen this now happening in almost 90% of the patients where we have done this in poseidon's 3 and 4 who refuse to take donor eggs the next thing in your checklist of course you have to pre plan whether you want to do fresh or frozen transfer we know that lot of fresh transfers fail because of supraphysiologic e2 levels elevated or low progesterone levels we also know that a lot of fresh embryo transfer pregnancies have a higher incidence of ectopics early pregnancy losses preterm labors and so on 
Of course, we know that frozen embryo transfer is better for a lot of reasons. Reduce risks of low birth weight, chemical pregnancies, ectopics and early pregnancy losses. So it seems to be better, but as a checklist, this is what you need to have a checklist that these are the patients where you must do a freeze also. Progesterone low or high on the day of HCG. Any patient who has had a previous biochemical pregnancy or early pregnancy loss or an ectopic pregnancy with fresh transfer, these three categories, this almost eliminates these three complications when you do a frozen transfer. Poor responders where you need to gather embryos month after month. Endometriosis, of course, you know, they need down regulation and frozen transfer. Then need for PGS and so on. High responders where you have to do a freeze all because you don't want hyperstimulation and you have used the agonist trigger. Patients with thin endometrium where you want to use GCSF, PRP and so on. And patients who have had repeated IVF failures with previous fresh transfers, please make it a point to do a frozen transfer. And you can see excellent results. Frozen transfer with the freeze all policy month after month. This was 2018 and even in 2019, it's at around 54%. So it really works well as compared to the 30-35% which you expect in a fresh transfer cycle. The only worry, recently there are some papers that with frozen transfer, there is a higher incidence of PIH with an odds ratio of 1.8 means almost twice the incidence of PIH. But uh, this might be related to the artificial preparation that we do and we need to fine tune that and go back to more natural cycle transfers to prevent this. The next of course important point checklist is when you start your egg retrieval. And here you, we know that what is the aim? You want to collect all mature oocytes. So you don't want to miss any oocytes after such a good stimulation of taking so much care. You don't want to end up with one or two eggs because of a bad technique of pickup. And you want to ensure that all the oocytes are kept at the right conditions throughout the procedure. So anesthesia, normally we prefer to use propofol at our clinic. I find it very difficult to do pickups without anesthesia or with parasovical blocks and so on, which is popular in some European countries. Uh, of course, you cannot use betadine wash because it will is toxic to the oocytes. So you have to just clean the vagina with normal saline. You have to, of course, cover your probe with a sterile sheath. You have to connect it to your aspiration pump. A single dose of IV augmentin usually suffices. And uh, there is a paper from Monash where uh, one, one lakh egg retrievals and there was no infection unless there is uh, some rare case where you uh, punctured the endometrioma repeatedly or went through it and caused some infection there. Important procedure is simple. You see the guideline here. Okay, so on the needle track mark, you have to just with a first jab and the puncture the vaginal wall and at the point of the maximum diameter of the follicle, you can see that happening here. And then you, with your foot pedal, you activate the aspiration unit, the suction unit. Wait till the follicle collapses. Keep moving the needle round as if you're curating the walls of the follicle and then move on to the next follicle. You don't have to withdraw the needle. You just go one to the next, to the next, to the next. So with one single vaginal puncture, you will remove all the oocytes. Now remember, very important to set 80 to 100 millimeters. Excessive pressure, more than 150, will cause stripping of the cumulus, cracks in the zona, and swelling of the oocytes. So it's very important to have a good pump. So normally we prefer a pump which can give you an exact 100 to 110 millimeters mercury. A follicular flushing is never required and when you do a curating of the follicle walls, there is a 22% increase in your oocyte yield. So these are some important practical points for your pickup. This is an example of a good aspiration unit. And again, as I told you, although it uh, can allows you to set from 30 to 300, but the best is 80 to 110 and it has a filter, air filter with a connector tubing. This needs to be changed once a month. And this is to prevent sometimes inadvertently follicular fluid. If your test tube fills up too fast, some fluid might go into the pump and damage it permanently. So if you have a filter like this, it stops it in time, but you need to change this every month. Test tube heaters are very important because you need to remember some important uh, facts that oocytes are very sensitive to temperature damage, especially when it goes below 32 degrees. If the nurse is holding the test tube in her hand, the hand temperature is usually a maximum of 30. So it is likely to damage the oocytes. You need to collect follicular fluids in a dedicated heater stand like this. And once you are done, when the fluid is full, then the test tube can be removed and quickly handed over to the lab in four or five seconds before there are any temperature drops. Also dissolved oxygen levels will increase, pH will increase. So you have to be conscious and be very fast when you are doing an egg retrieval like this. Screening procedures, of course, you can see here, the oocyte cumulus complexes are identified. 
This is how it looks when you normally see it under the microscope. And then, uh, of course, if it's an ICSI case, then you denude them and transfer them to droplets like this. If it's an IVF case, then you just have to put it maybe one or two per well in a simple four well dish. So this is, of course, more of the laboratory side, but just uh, for the sake of completion. Complications, the only one which I really see is vaginal bleeding is usually eight to 10%. So one in 10 patients will have some bleeding. Very rarely, maybe once in a once or twice in a year, I need to take a stitch. Otherwise, just a simple pressure uh, usually pack works and the bleeding stops on its own. So, of course, the other things in your learning uh, period, maybe some trauma, infection, but usually all these things don't happen. Torsion is quite common, especially when you have too many 40-50 follicles. You're given the agonist trigger, but you have to make sure you tell the patient that at least for 48 hours, don't have any sudden movements or jerky movements or try to be at rest. So that although you won't have OHSS, but the ovaries could twist and uh, give you a complication of torsion. Troubleshooting, sometimes common questions I get, oh, the fluid doesn't come at a good speed. You have to just make sure that your pump is proper, that your pedal is being uh, depressed properly. Check all the tubings once again. Commonly, when you get a batch of test tubes, some of the test tubes are cracked and you will keep uh, rattling your head, okay, why the fluid is not coming, not coming. It's because the test tube is somewhere cracked, so the air leaks out and there's no suction developing in the tube. Rotate the needle in the follicle to ensure that it is not blocked by follicular wall tissue. That sometimes can stop the flow. Sometimes if the needle gets blocked, you need to remove it, perform a retrograde flush, clear out the needle and then reinsert it. And that's the usual things which you have. Very important is, of course, before you do the pickup, very important to check the name, date, ID, allergies, consent forms, most important in today's world with today's medical legal atmosphere and uh, cloud always on us. Please make sure that all consents have been adequately taken. Uh, make sure that you know the lab knows whether it's an IVF case, whether it's an ICSI case, whether she's for fresh transfer or a frozen transfer. Make sure your ultrasound machine is top of the line and working well. All your tubes are well connected. The suction pressure is proper and ideal, not too much so that you don't damage the oocytes. <coughs> Most important, double check the patient's ID. Either have manual witness, means you have two embryologists, never a single person working. So one supervises the other and makes sure that the labeling is proper. Or more recently, as a lot of us are installing now, are the witness systems, automation, barcoding on the test tubes, petri dishes, and so on. So the loud alarms start going off if by mistake somebody's sperm is going into somebody else's oocyte dish. So of course, all these things you have to be very careful. And it's always a good habit to tell the patient how many eggs were collected. You have to see their expression. When you tell them, oh, you got 10 eggs, 15 eggs, they are really happy. So make it a good point to always meet the patient before discharge, just to tell her that we got these many eggs and they're looking good or whatever the case may be. And finally, of course, embryo transfer. Uh, it's a whole lecture in itself, which I think I gave to a lot of this audience before, but just to highlight some few very important points. And that is don't neglect the technique or take it for granted. If you look at this list of the causes of recurrent IVF failure, one of the most important is poor embryo transfer techniques. So almost 30% of failures maybe because of this. When you are a beginner, please remember that you should not have a difficult transfer. So a trial or a mock ET is very important so that you can record whether it's antiverted, retroverted, the length of the canal, whether it's a difficult angle, or whether you will need a stillet or it will walk in, all those things you need to know. Ultrasound helps a lot because you can evaluate the angle, you can find out if any fibroids or submucous fibroids are present. Very common in infertility patients are false passages. So please, please be wary of this. I've had one patient who's failed six IVF cycles before she came to me. And then somehow on ultrasound, I saw an artifact. And when we passed the sound under ultrasound guidance, whatever I did, it would always go into the false passage. So we realized that all six attempts failed because her embryos were going in the wrong place. Finally, a good hysteroscopy was done. We noted down the real canal where it was going. And with a good full bladder under anesthesia, we did a transfer and first shot, she had a twin pregnancy. So this is very important that please look out for these false passages, especially patients who have had repeated hysteroscopies, DNCs, miscarriages, all kinds of intrauterine interventions where this is commonly observed. So you have to make sure, even in cases of previous LSCS, very commonly your catheter might just go into the LSCS car and get coiled up there and you'll be happy thinking you transferred the embryos but end up with a failed cycle. When to do the mock transfer? You can do it early on day two of menstruation. You can also, if you forget, you can do it on the day of egg retrieval. You are not going to traumatize the endometrium and you can see pregnancy rates are the same 
ongoing pregnancy rates 48 48% even if you do a mock transfer on the day of retrieval and a fresh embryo transfer so it doesn't really traumatize endometrium but it's very important that you know where you have to put your embryos sometimes you fail to negotiate the internal loss so then ultrasound guidance of course you just uh, if you're using an afterloading technique, you have not yet withdrawn the embryos from the incubator. So you just tell her to wait, fill up her bladder. Most of the time this solves the problem because it straightens the canal and helps the catheter to go in. If it still doesn't go, then you can switch to a rigid uh, catheter. If your soft catheter is not negotiating the internal os, if that doesn't work, then use a malleable guide wire, which you have to design for your particular embryo transfer set so that you can give shape to the outer sheath, then make sure that it passes uh, to the intrauterine cavity. You can, I always use an Alice forceps and pull the anterior lip so that I straighten the canal. And if all that fails, which is very, very rare, maybe one in a thousand, then you have to abandon transfer, put up for a hysteroscopy, check out where the cavity is, make a note, dilate it, do a resection of the internal loss, whatever your surgeons like to do, and then poster for a frozen transfer subsequently. So this is how we design locally these stilettes, which go through the Sydney outer sheets. And you can see it comes with a curve but it's not a very fixed memory curve. So when you start negotiating a difficult canal, it straightens up. But if you pass this guide wire through that, then you are able to give it much better shape and it holds on and passes through much better. Some of you may say, oh, that will reduce the pregnancy rate. It doesn't. You can see with the cannulation, your pregnancy rate is the same. Even if almost half the patients may have some blood on the catheter when you withdraw it, still your pregnancy rates are not affected. Please do after loading and don't do direct transfer. Direct transfer means you just put the Alice and the same speculum and your embryologist comes ready with the loaded catheter, both the outer and inner sheets. And then you keep struggling, struggling, struggling. Embryos are being exposed to the atmosphere and you lose your pregnancy. So always first put the outer sheath. Make sure it has crossed the internal loss. Then you load the inner catheter. Either the embryologist loads or you load. Then come back and pass it through so that within 20, 30, 40 seconds, your embryos are from the incubator to the fundal region of the endometrium because anything more than 120 seconds and you are going to lose your pregnancy because that is too much of toxic damage to the embryos. So after loading, always preferred. Uh, normally, I like to do it in just 20 to 30 microliters. So these are the embryos. And on both sides, you have small air gaps and then again, medium. This is how the tip of the catheter would look. And you have to be very uh, proper with your injection pressure. Most important, you should know that what pressure you need for your syringe, whichever you're using, the BD syringe or the tubercle in syringe, and keep your piston pressure till you withdraw the catheter completely. If you release the pressure, you will suck back the embryos and create a lot of failure or a withdrawing back of the embryo into your catheter. Where to place the embryos? The best results are if you put it at one and a half to 2.5 centimeters from the fundus. You can see almost a doubling of the pregnancy rate as against if you go very near to the fundus, where not only do the pregnancy rates go down, but you also increase your risk of an ectopic pregnancy. Ultrasound guidance, not compulsory. As you can see this large study here, if it's an experienced operator, once you have done say about 500, 600 embryo transfers, ultrasound guidance does not provide any benefit. So once you are experienced, you know where you're going, both the ultrasound group and the blind group give the same clinical pregnancy rate. So finally, it's up to you. And to end, of course, a lot of you may argue, but I showed this slide earlier too, that you do have a lot of benefits when you do frozen transfer as against fresh. And some of you might be concerned, what about congenital anomalies with vitrification? And again, we have this large study comparing fresh and frozen, malformation rate same, no difference between the two. So you can rest assured that it's pretty safe. And if it's giving you almost a double pregnancy rate in all the categories I showed you, it's definitely worth doing this. So once again, I'd like to thank Kaveri once again. She really wonderfully puts together this uh, Jugalbandi webinar between the two of us. And of course, MQR Pharma once again, Rajiv and the whole team for always doing such an excellent job. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jatin. It was super, uh, like always. And we've got lots and lots of requests for uh, the recording of this webinar, which I'm sure we'll provide. Uh, I just have a minute presentation on embryo transfer techniques, what we follow at our end. So if you could, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so basically, it's
it's uh, what Dr. Jatin Shah sir has just mentioned. However, uh, again, uh, I think it's very important that we start from basics. And uh, in, our, in the basics, we have uh, history. So if the patient has told you she's had difficult IUIs or embryo transfer, either she perceived them as difficult or the doctor told her that it was difficult. So please keep that in mind that your embryo transfer may not be as easy as you think. Again, the access of the cervix is very important. You should not you know, be surprised on the last day of embryo transfer just because you haven't done a PS before. And review all the hysteroscopic findings, um, as uh, Dr. Jatin has just mentioned, false passages, difficult hysteroscopy, all these things should be there in your checklist. And also the total number of embryos that you transfer. This webinar is all about optimizing outcome. And I strongly feel that number of embryos to transfer is a very critical factor in result. And if it is young, we put in fewer. If it is older with multiple failures, we put in higher. And we should not shy away from it, considering it to be wrong practice. Even the ASRM has said that in older multiple failure patients, we can put in higher number of patients. And we must, if that's what your clinic uh, has uh, failure patients coming up. So simple embryo transfer is what we've just discussed. We always afterload, as uh, Dr. Jatin has mentioned, it clearly reduces the loading to transfer time and improves your result. Uh, once it's, we do ultrasound guidance all the time. And yes, though you get the feel and with experience, you perhaps may not need it. But I always like to see the bubble uh, at the mid cavity, thickest endometrium region, really gives me a lot of satisfaction. And uh, the latest guideline uh, from ASRM uh, has said that abdominal ultrasound, removal of cervical mucus, soft embryo transfer, placing the embryo at the right point, and immediate ambulation. We do about 15 20 minutes. These are the steps that help in improving. They have been proven by randomized control trials. The others on the other side have not proven like acupuncture, analgesic, prophylactic antibiotics, waiting for expulsion, putting your catheter in and slowly taking it out. These definitely don't help. And difficult embryo transfer is what if you are using, uh, you know, a firmer, you need to use a firmer catheter. You can also use general anesthesia. So we we'll just come to that. There are grades of difficulty in embryo transfer. And the quicker you do it, the smoother you do it, the higher are your results. And there are certain points which will give you positive and negative results. Blood on catheter was a big point earlier, but as Dr. Jatin has just mentioned, if you've used a stylet and there is blood on the outer, it does not reduce your pregnancy rates. Uh, we are quite fond of the Labotech catheter uh, in difficult embryo transfer. Many a times those with a false passage or the fibroid just intending the cervix path, you are not able to put in your soft catheter even with a stylet. And then this metallic Labotech catheter comes to your aid and the placements are wonderful. And uh, there have been various steps, mock transfer, uh, we uh, do uh, in difficult cases performing a dilatation, performing hysteroscopic management. These are certain steps that have been universally agreed. And the hysteroscopic correction, cervical dilatation is a uh, treatment of choice in difficult cases. And uh, so what do we do? We basically definitely do a PS examination in difficult cases, a mock embryo transfer, hysteroscopic cervical negotiation or dilatation, a partial full bladder. This is a small point, but has a big impact. If you have a huge bladder pressing on the cervix, you're going to have a difficult transfer and difficult placement, difficult visualization. So have a semi-full partial bladder so that the uterus is straight and your visualization is good. Afterload technique, use of the appropriate stylet, and in certain cases, general anesthesia. We have uh, published a paper where we have shown that, in, especially in women with non-consummation, 
say with oligospermia and uh, we have used general anesthesia and we have compared the results and the results are same in the GA and the non-GA group. So once again, thank you NCURE and thank you Dr. Jatin for this uh, wonderful evening of sharing uh, our experiences. I really enjoyed it and uh, we shall be happy to take a few questions before we end. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, fantastic session. In fact, uh, uh, this session of yours has always received a lot of praises from all uh, doctors. And uh, even before the session, we have received so many requests about uh, uh, all the correct timings and essentials and recordings and all. Uh, I'll not take a lot of time, but uh, we have a lot of questions. I'll take some selected few. So my first question, is uh, Dr. Kaveri Banerjee, ma'am. Uh, the question comes from uh, uh, Dr. Niranjan Jay Krishna. He asks, what size of myoma will you leave alone? So obviously uh, it depends on the uh, position. Uh, definitely we all know that subserous we can leave. Uh, then uh, submucus, whatever be the size, we cannot leave. So the question is actually about intramural fibroids. Again, intramural fibroid, even if they are small and impinging into the cavity with repeated failures, there is a question of either hysteroscopic or hysterolapro removal of fibroid. But if it is, say, a two to three centimeter fibroid not impinging into the cavity with not so many failures, I would leave them alone. Great. Thank you, ma'am. I hope, Dr. Jayakrishna, this answers your question. Uh, so the next question is for you. Uh, Dr. Sapna Srinivas is asking Dr. Jatin Shah, sir, what are the precautions you are taking now in COVID era at stimulation, OPU, uh, et cetera, and freezing also? Yeah, so I'm still following the SA, SRM, and uh, SR uh, guidelines. So we have not done anything for the last three or four months. In fact, tomorrow morning is the first frozen embryo transfer that we are beginning our uh, clinic again with. Uh, but these are scary times, so we have not yet planned for ovarian stimulations. Egg donor program is on hold, surrogate mother program is on hold. Uh, we are not doing any stimulations at all for anybody. So right now it is just completing frozen transfers for those who had their stimulations in the beginning of this year and who are in a real hurry and just keep telling us every day, Doc, when are you starting, when are you starting? Uh, we have not yet started even seeing new OPD patients. So things are quite scary in Mumbai, so it all depends on which area you are in. So, Everything around me right now is red, red, red. Even the clinic is in a red zone. Residence is in a red zone. And uh, it's still 1,000 new cases a day in Mumbai, although it's plateaued now at 1,000, but 1,000 is still a huge number. So let's see. We are hoping for August things get better for us. Right, sir. I've answered a lot of questions on the chat. In fact, till this question, I've answered all the questions. So now, after that, if there's anything, you can please ask me. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, next question goes to Dr. Kaviri Banerjee, ma'am. There are actually three questions on TESA sample. Uh, ma'am, the first question by Dr. Khushi, she's saying, if no sperm found in TESA sample, so what to do? Second ka se question is, how much sample of TESA we should use? And the third question is, in which dish TESA sample will be collected and prepared? So obviously when you're taking a patient for TESA, you must take the proper consents that what if you don't get the sperm? Uh, some will give you donor sperm consent, some will not give you. So those who don't give donor sperm consent, you must freeze, take consent for freezing oocytes. Uh, how much TESA sperm? It all depends on really how much we find. So in a sample of TESA, we find a few good motile sperms. Uh, that's good enough for a fresh ICSI. But if you want to freeze the sample, you need a TESA sperm and some more material on it. And the dish is that you have the sperm, uh, spermatic fluid uh, from the lab with the sperm handling media. And then you take the sperm uh, testicular tissue and put it in the media and give it to the embryologist. The embryologist then uses the 5 mm syringe with the needle and then teases the sample and then looks for TESA sperm. Ideally, if your embryologist is telling you within five minutes that there is no sperm, 
uh, I usually tell them that if it's a testicular biopsy, please do not give me the answer before half an hour at least. So they look at it, they centrifuge it, they re-centrifuge it. And until then, we are very sure because this is the lifetime opportunity for the patient and we must give it our 100%. Great. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, hope, doctor, uh, you have received your answer. Sir, one question. Uh, I was just wondering, have you answered? Yes, you have answered, sir, Dr. Victoria Johnson. Um, so almost most of the questions are answered, sir. One question from Dr. Reinuchuk. Uh, for audience, I would like to repeat it. Uh, it is a case study. Sometime on day two, there is no asynchrony. But when we start stimulation and do USG on day seven, one follicle is ahead of others by four to five mm. What to do? Oh, so that's a very good question. And that's why I highlighted that in antagonist protocol, you must use pre-medication. So don't start on day two, irrespective of your ultrasound findings or hormone estimations. If it is showing you oh, nothing has started, you must give pre-medication exactly to avoid this kind of scenario. Because this is why Poseidon 1 and 2 is called unexpected. Because they had everything normal, but they did not give you a good response. And most often it is because of asynchrony. For some reason, the dominant follicle has already been recruited. Sometimes you can't see it on ultrasound. And then on day seven, you see one follicle shooting ahead. So that is why pre-medication, either estradiol or norethisterone or antagonist for three days is a must for all antagonist cycles. In agonist, you don't need to do it because the agonist itself, the down regulation is your pretreatment. But in antagonist cycle, one of these three must be given. OC pill is out of my list. But if you must use it, then less, just about 10 days, not more than 15 days for sure. Great. Uh, so, sir, uh, actually we have outrun the time. So if yeah. you all permit, uh, I'll request uh, uh, that we can close the session. Dear participants, thank you for participating. Rajiv, sir, may I request you to give closing remarks? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amit. Uh, on behalf of MTO Pharmaceutical, I would like to thank Dr. Kaveri Benerjee, Dr. Jatin Shah for a wonderful uh, webinar, sir. And people were so excited that we were getting the calls last one week. Uh, what is the time and all that. And even a lot of requests is coming for the recording also. So definitely we'll provide the recording. I have shared the number, so we'll provide the recording link and it was live on Facebook also and we'll give the YouTube link also and recording. And I thank all the doctors who have patiently here in the webinar. Uh, it was really wonderful. You both have a deadly combination. Whenever you come, a lot of excitement comes. Right. So, right. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, we are privileged and honored. And we wish you a very safe and healthy life and Corona cases are increasing day by day. We wish very healthy and safe life to you and all the doctors who have joined. And thanks my team also for doing a lot of hard work for this webinar. And we have seen not a single doctor logged out till the last presentation. That is really wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kabir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jatin. Thank you, MQR. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So with your permission, I'll close the session. Dear participants, there is a YouTube channel called IVA. IVF Virtual Academy, where you will find this recording uh, by tomorrow end of the day. Thank you very much. See you all soon. Thank you. I'll end the presentation, sir. Thank you.